OK. Well, hi, everybody. I guess we're getting started. Uh, and behind schedule, so that's great. Um, I'm Greg Blumquist. Uh, I've been at Red Hat about 18 years. Uh, I've been a manager for about 10 years. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of the things I wish I knew when I started as a manager. Um, uh, one of the things I've noticed since I've become a manager and as I've been a manager for a while is I meet new managers who they, they get taught the tools. So they get introduced to things like Workday and other things that we have to use all the time. And then they'll say, but, but, but how do I do a one-on-one? -on -one? Like, ooh, they don't, they don't teach you that. Uh, and I'm not going to say I'm the expert at this, but uh, I've learned some things over 10 years. I just thought I would share some of that. Uh, before we do, this is me. Uh, I grew up around Portland, Oregon. That massive mountain in the background is Mount Hood. Uh, I loved it there. But then the dot-com bubble burst, and we had, I had to, I mean, I had a job. It was a bad job, and I wanted a better job. Uh, and we found a better job in uh, Raleigh. Uh, my wife found it. She's from North Carolina. We met in Oregon, so we moved back to North Carolina for her. Uh, I started at Red Hat in 2006, and I became a manager in 2014 on Cloud Forms. We've got some Cloud Forms friends over here. <laughs> and I learned nothing. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I am now a senior manager on Auto and Edge. Um, this is stuff I want to talk about today. So uh, managing a team, what, what does that mean? Managing individuals, what kinds of things have I learned about that? And then really like, managing yourself. Like how, how, do you, uh, how do you take care of yourself as a manager? Uh, disclaimer, I struggle with every bit of this stuff. I'm not an expert on any of this stuff. Um, uh, it's that kind of thing where if someone asks me a question, I can tell them what they should be doing, even though I might not be doing it. Uh, let's talk about managing a team. I love this guy. He's like, yes. And everyone's clapping. I don't know why they're clapping. What did he do? Who knows? But he's pointing at managing a team. Uh, OK, start with why. I know I stole this from Simon Sinek, and he probably stole it from someone else. Um, but really, people want a why. They want to know why are they working on the thing they're working on. Um, why can be a purpose and a vision, like very formalized kinds of statements. Uh, why can also be just a shared understanding of the importance of what the team is doing. So for automotive, as an example, uh, we want to put safe Linux in cars. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, creating safe Linux, we will be the first ones to do that. If, we, uh, if we're able to do that, I'll say when, when we do that, um, it'll also have a major impact on RHEL. Uh, so for us, it's important to see uh, revenue lines go up. But it's also important to consider safety and what we're doing. Um, so if, we, if I can successfully build that message around why is this stuff important, and when we get diverted to focus on something like safety, which isn't always the most fun thing, uh, there's still a why underneath there. People can still say, yeah, OK, I get it. I get, I get why we have to go do this thing. It's OK to be diverted for six to, you know, six to nine months to go do this. Um, this is where I focus all the time. I want to grow leaders uh, because I don't scale. Uh, I can't be everywhere. So I want to have strong leaders. Um, I'm going to get to some of these things in more depth, like identify leaders. But that's step one. Like, through one-on-ones and talking to people, identify people that understand how to connect with others, uh, but also have a deep understanding of the technology. And that sounds, those are just words that describe how to do that. That's still hard. That's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to recognize people that can do that kind of thing. Um, delegate that leadership. 
two people so that they can grow and become better leaders uh, and build that partnership with your leads so that information goes both ways. You're getting information from your leaders on your teams. Um, it's not just you passing information down. You should be learning things from leaders. Or I, sh I should say, I learn things from my leaders all the time. Uh, know the deliverables. So it's probably where I struggle the most in managing a team is keeping track of what's going on. Um, that's why the previous slide for me is so important to have strong leaders that know what's going on. But it's, it's my weakness, and I know this. Um, but it's important to understand the purpose and the backlog that your team is working on. That direction can change over time. And if the backlog is capturing history instead of future, uh, you need to know that. You need to know, wait, 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 wait. Are we still attacking the right problem? Um, Short-term goals are important, but also keeping a big mental picture of how everything fits together so you know how your team is also interacting with other teams and spreading out across organizations and portfolios. Uh, this last bit is actually my real superpower. Be OK asking dumb questions. Um, be OK being in the room, hearing something said that you may not know, and say, wait, can we stop for a second and explain that concept? Because I don't know what you're talking about. There's probably someone else in the room who has that same question, is afraid to ask. But as a manager, for me at least, uh, it's kind of OK if I don't know. It's OK if I'm dumb um, and I can ask that question. Uh, these little notes in the bottom are just kind of like my little personal notes as we're going along. So I, I do struggle with keeping up with technology. Um, so as the team adopts new technologies or branches out to new things, it's always me being the last one to understand, like, wait, why do we use that? Why, why is the team using that thing? Um, so let's go into managing individuals. Um, for me, like every time I start on a new team or a new team is given to me or anything like that, I have to find the way to build trust immediately with each individual. Um, I do it through vulnerability, honesty, and being trying, trying my best to be reliable. Uh, taking responsibility for mistakes is so important because it feeds back into that honesty and reliability. Um, if you can admit that you did something wrong when you know you did something wrong and then apologize for it and move forward, that trust builds and grows stronger. People respect that you acknowledge the fact that you messed up and you can move on. Um, I've got a little footnote next to show genuine interest because this comes from how to win friends and influence people. Um, uh, years and years ago, years and years and years ago, uh, Matt Hicks told me to read that book. Um, and that's something that is, that show genuine interest is, it's real. Like, uh, I was talking to Douglas about this the other day, about talking to somebody. He's like, yeah, OK, you just kind of like nod and say, yeah, yeah, OK, I get it, I get it, uh-huh, uh-huh. It's like, no, you got to like really listen, really take it in. Uh, one of the things I do for this is reflective listening, which is just saying the thing back that someone said to you. So they told you something. They, what I heard you say is this. And it doesn't sound like that in a discussion. That sounds very I'm on a stage kind of thing. but Finding ways to repeat the thing back to somebody, synthesized through your own brain and back to them, shows them that you're listening and you understand what they're trying to say. Um, and it helps. It helps build that. Helps. It helps continue building that trust. Uh, do your one-on-ones. Do your one-on-ones. Uh, this is the template that I use for my one-on-one -on -one invites. Um, I, it just just those lines. Just hey. Share things with me. Talk to me. Occasionally, I'm going to tell you things like bonuses. Hey, awesome. Uh, maybe less great things. Um, but sometimes I'll have things to share. Uh, learn what drives and drains your team members. Um, really, I mean, I focus a lot of my time. I talk about this background process that runs in my head, which is thinking about people's career paths. Um, I, that's something I can't shut off. 
just a process that runs. So if someone's talking to me about something and they show a little interest in something, I'll go, oh, you know, you know, Red Hat, like if someone says something, something, something AI. And I go, oh, you, you, you know, Red Hat's really investing in this. And there's maybe opportunity over here uh, and maybe not on this team. And maybe there's an opportunity for you to grow in a new place. But you know, just listening um, about what they're interested in and learning about their career path and trying to help them, uh, trying to help them understand what that looks like. But also, then you get into the, the promotion talk. Uh, it's important to start this discussion early. Um, do not wait until you think someone's ready for a promotion to talk about the promotion. Try to set some kind of, I use the term horizon. Try to think about what's on, what's out way in front of you. Um, where, you sh where are you headed towards? And have a common shared understanding of what that horizon looks like. How far away, like talk in, talk in terms of like months. How, is it 24 months away? It's 36 months away? Talk in terms of months where, where this is, but be clear that that can move, <laughs> like that can come in sometimes. Sometimes it can go out. So be clear that like this this has changed. We need to we need to talk about this again and talk about where this horizon is. You will almost never control this process. <laughs> Promotions, the promotion process is what it is, and you are you are you and the associate are a puppet in it, and you have to play within those rules, but but know what that process is. Also the thing about owning and delegating, um, do not put it all onto the associate and do not own the entire thing. Uh, share it. The associate has to be involved in, um, in the process of talking about the promotion and, 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 and even filling out whatever, you know, if there's paperwork and things like that, they, they should be involved in that. Uh, the money talk, this is awkward, money's awkward. People don't like talking about money. They don't like talking about how much they make. You know how much they make, and they don't like talking about it. Um, it's okay to talk. It's okay to acknowledge the fact there's a budget. You know you are restricted by a budget. Have the same horizon discussion. Talk about what the horizon is. If it, like if if you have an 18-month rule at your company where every 18 months you're shooting for some kind of increase, talk about what that is and what you're trying to shoot for there um, in connection with the previous slide. One of the things that um, in our organization we've talked about a lot to minimize the impact of the salary increase at the time of promotion, we've talked about uh, split it out if you can like have smaller increases along the way that then cumulatively add up to the increase you wanted them to have at the time of promotion. Um, that can be a strategy for kind of spreading out the impact of a, let's say a 10% increase or something like that. I'm making a number up. Um, also, again, you will almost never control this process in, entirely. Uh, the performance talk, this is probably the hardest part of the job. Um, I learned a phrase from uh, Paul Freilds, who was, uh, he, still, he still is a director at Red Hat. Um, he he, he uh, told me the phrase, the friendly manager syndrome, which I, <laughs> I fall into that really hard. Um, I try to be someone's friend before I be their manager. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that I know that I do. But if you can avoid, uh, if you can avoid that with, while still being friendly, it's a, it's a tricky balance to strike. But if you can avoid uh, having the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the emotional connection to somebody at that friend level while still being very friendly with them and caring for them and caring about their future. 
Um, it's a, it's, it, is, it is a tricky balance to strike. Um, it'll make a lot of these other things easier, um, like addressing performance concerns immediately. If there's a performance concern that you have, uh, don't let it linger. If it's an immediate, if it's if like an egregious performance situation, do not wait for a one-on-one -on -one to talk about it. Just ha say, hey, can we, can we jump on a call and talk about something? Uh, that's going to scare somebody, <laughs> that phrase. But if it's an immediate conversation, it's not like they're waiting a week. Just like, oh, God, what do they want to talk about? Um, in that discussion, talking about uh, performance, rely, we, we, at Red Hat, we call them competencies which is the, the, the list of things that we expect out of a certain role level, sorry. Uh, rely on those competencies when you're talking about your expectations for somebody in that role. Um, those are your guardrails. Those are the things that are going to help you frame that conversation. Uh, it is easier if you set those expectations early. But if you don't, admit it. Like previous slide said, admit you made a mistake. Apologize and move on. Set those expectations at that time and move on. Um, something that's not written here and probably should have been a little, little yellow thing at the bottom is uh, if it if it's a serious situation, even if it isn't a serious situation, you're kind of stuck. You're not sure how to move forward. Talk to HR. Uh, they they can help. They 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 can get involved and give you feedback and give you a framework and talk about some of the stuff. They can even. Uh, spitball some of the approaches to how you would bring up this conversation. Um, there's some real diamonds hiding in HR that can help with this stuff. I almost said next slide. <coughs> <laughs> Managing yourself. Um, you, being a manager, it takes a toll on you as an individual. Um, you have to recognize that toll. You have to recognize it takes a toll. You're responsible for several people. Like, you can make a decision that will affect someone's livelihood. And that is a serious weight on our shoulders. Like, that, that is, uh, it's really tough to cross that line, to actually say that. Like, I'm, I'm impacting you now. I'm changing your life. Um, sometimes, next slide, uh, Eric and I have talked about this a little bit. Uh, I was part of the interview team with Eric and um, ultimately got him hired. Got him hired. <laughs> he got himself hired. Um, but it was a positive impact. <laughs> and that was a great, that was a great thing. It positively impacted Eric's life. I think, I hope. Yeah, no, no. Yes. Course, yeah. <laughs> I'll be like the guy, yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, but you're responsible for people, and you will be treated like a therapist sometimes. People will bring their problems to you, um, and sometimes they're real problems, like outside of work problems, like problems with their life that it's impacting. I just closed one of my rings. Um, <laughs> uh, it'll be a real problem in their life that's impacting their work but it's their life and they'll bring it to you because they're afraid of what it looks like on paper at work. And you're going to be treated like the person that had, they're asking for help. Um, and that's tough. And that's one of those places where it's good to go back and say, hey, HR, uh, what can I do? We have resources at Red Hat, things like the EAP, the Employee Assistance Program. There's other things that you can kind of direct people to. Those are hit and miss sometimes. Uh, I know a lot of people that have taken advantage of the EAP and really got something out of it, and I know other people that have been frustrated by it. Um, but you know, and, and engage with the HR team if something is getting really serious. Uh, and also, people will rarely look after you as a manager. You're looking after all these people, but who's looking after you? Who, <laughs> who therapizes a therapist? Um, This one's really important to me. Get a mentor. Um, I'm bad at this. I should be better at this. I should, I should get more mentors for me. Um, 
shouldn't be your manager. Your, your manager is not your mentor. Uh, I love Jeff. He's my manager. But I, and I get a lot out of our manager-employee relationship. I really do. Not, and not just because he's sitting there. Um, <laughs> but uh, there are other viewpoints out there. There's other management styles. There's other ways that people see how problems work themselves out. Um, yeah, and go find people like that and learn from their, uh, from their management styles. And why only get one? You can get two, three, four, five. I mean, you know, however many handle and or how, however many your schedule can handle. Um, I learned this one from Jeff. Uh, find your third place. Um, third place is that concept of like, you know, you have home where family is. You have uh, work where work is. Um, but then there's like, what do you do outside of that? Uh, I also struggle with this. I struggle with this a lot. I'm, I, pre-COVID, uh, was a workaholic. Like I went, that was where I go. I go to work, and that, that that I lived there. Um, I've been trying to get back into things that interest me. Uh, that's that's hard. It's hard to get back into those, you know, in, into things that I like. It's hard to break those walls back down and get into stuff. Um, but I do it like once a month, once every two weeks. I go hang out with some friends at a local brewery. We just kind of you know hang out for a couple hours. People that live near me. That, that are also redheaders, so it's kind of also work. But we don't talk about work, uh, ever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, try, try to you know, find your third place. Find, find what is the thing. It could be a hobby. It could be you alone doing your hobby. Uh, it could be you with a group, uh, a running club, a biking club, whatever. Um, doesn't have to be exercise related. Um, some other topics, uh, so that's, that was the list of things that I, I, I cut a lot out, and I just saw the 10 minute warning, so I'm probably good that I cut a, cut a lot out. Um, but other things that I didn't include, like building your network, uh, being able to go out and talk to other managers, that's part of like getting a mentor, that's part of your network, but peers, uh, you being a mentor to others is also building your network, sharing the things that you've learned, um, managing up, so, how do you manage your manager or your management chain? Uh, they can be a great support system for you. If there's things that you can't get done or don't, don't want to get done, uh, talk to your manager and say, hey, this is something that's just, it's, uh, it's in my way. It's in my way, and I need to go focus on this other thing. Uh, how can you help me? And maybe the answer is, I can't. you got to do both things. It's like, okay, <laughs> at least you asked, but, you know, rely on that management chain. Uh, and is, this is just kind of open question, is there such a thing as too much transparency? I like to be transparent. I probably share too much about what's going on inside the company and salaries and blah, 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 blah uh, with associates. Um, I probably am too transparent there. I don't know, is there such a thing as that? Uh, that's a rhetorical question we can talk about some other time. Um, these are my resources that I wanted to include. I already mentioned the top book. Uh, Crucial Conversations, I took that course couple, five years ago. Um, it was great. Like, it, we got to do it in person at the time. Um, it was a good course. We, I, I learned a lot about myself, uh, about how I communicate. Um, and learning how to build that shared pool of truth with somebody. Uh, Tilt 365, you know, I. It, Someone told me that's horoscopes for uh, managers. It is, it really is, but sometimes it's also right. Um, Mars and retrograde or whatever they say. Um, uh, engineering, manager, engineering Management for the Rest of Us is a book by Sarah Drasner. Drasner? I don't know how she says her last name. Um, I read through that and took a lot of interesting things out of it. Uh, so some of the stuff I included in these slides, some of it I wanted to include and didn't. I uh, just didn't have time for. Um, that's it. Uh, the questions, people want to learn more, people want to talk about things. I see one question. Are we doing mics? Or, oh, yes, we got a runner. 
So you talk about having um, a mentor or other mentors, mm. right, for yourself. <coughs> How do you, um, who's obviously not your manager, what kind of questions, what kind of conversations do you have with that person? Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Okay, good. Uh, uh, the, the question was, uh, when you get a mentor for you, when someone's mentoring you, what kinds of questions do you bring to that mentor? Um, I'll, I'll start with technical things, Te tech manager technical things. Hey, how do, how do you delegate? How do you do uh, tr trust and verify? What does that look like to you? Um, but then that'll open up things. That, I, I use those as foot in the door type discussions and then uh, as that discussion grows, I'm gonna listen for things that I can, I can key in more. Say, wait, wait, you said something I don't understand. You, let, let, me, let me drill, I, I need to know more about what you just said about this thing. And so it, I do it very organically. I don't, I don't have like a set of things I try to um, key in off. Okay, but how do you start? Yeah, no, I, I start there. I start with the technical manager things, delegation, um, if uh, that, that's a great one because every, every manager should be doing that and if, if you get if you get somebody who's who's a mentor and has good ideas around it it'll open up a great larger conversation Does that help cool uh, how do you avoid shortchanging high performers you know often they're the, the easier people where you might look forward to that one-on-one -on -one because you don't have a big issue with them, but often you can have, there can be a case where they're not getting feedback or you know, they're just, they're not, maybe not getting the engagement. You know, be, no, no, it, it, it's a really good question. So uh, quick anecdote, uh, I'll try to keep it really short. Um, when my kids were in school, younger, they were high performers. Uh, they have this, the typical syndrome of, as they got older, <laughs> that worked against them. <laughs> but uh, they were high performers in school, and so we would go into a teacher-parent conference, and they'd say, we're not worried about Max. Like, but, 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 but I am. Um, and we wouldn't get a lot of time or feedback. And so I, I think that's what you're asking. Like, when someone's doing really well, and it looks like the manager's devoting all their time to other situations, let's say, the high performers not getting the attention for growing their career where they go, okay. So um, my approach, especially with uh, people that I'm trying to grow as leads, uh, I'm, I'm carving out that time. Uh, what I've done in the past is with team leads, and this isn't exactly analogous, but I'm, it should fit in the same kind of zone. Um, I will do, and I will typically do with everybody else every two weeks one on one, half hour. But I'll leave time. I'll leave a buffer zone so we can go over. Um, with team leads, I'll do an hour every week. So I'll put more time in that space because part of it is because I'm getting something out of that discussion, but part of it is because I want to make sure that person has a clear has that clear runway to what is next for me. Because uh, everyone's worried about, everyone's thinking about that, not necessarily worried about it, but people are thinking about that. What is next for me? How do I continue growing? Uh, and that's a bigger discussion with someone at a higher level. I, I don't know if that helps. Is that? Okay, cool. Yeah, sure. Hey, if you've got time. Okay. So, Athletics has been a large part of my life, and hearing your discussion, in my mind, there's a mental model between being a manager and being the coach of like a sports team. To what extent does that you know, align with your experience, and where do you see that kind of breakdown where what you're doing can't really be described as coaching as a manager? It, it's a really good question, and it probably gets into a lot more than two minutes. Um, so what I'll, 
what I'll do, Adam and I work in the same office, but what I, if anybody wants to keep talking, I'm happy to talk out, out there. Um, but I, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a really good question. I, I don't, I, the short answer is probably sometimes they're orthogonal. Like, I've never been a coach for a team, so I, I don't know all the things that overlap. But uh, yeah, there's probably a lot of orthogonal pieces too, along with what looks like overlapping. Um, I think that's it. I think that's all we have time for. That's time. Let's give Greg a round of applause.